up opera and conditioning, it can confuse the heck out of you. Almost everywhere you try to look up the definitions of opera and conditioning, they make it far more complicated than it has to be. All right. So this will make it a little bit easier for you. All right. So what you want to remember with opera and conditioning is to break it down into small pieces. The smaller pieces you break down the terminology, the easier it's going to make it for you. This is the first place where people generally go wrong with opera and conditioning. It's just with the words positive and negative. Uh, people think of like positive is good and negative is bad. Never think about, never ever refer to it as good or bad or think positive is rewards and negative is punishment. Think of it more like mathematics. Positive just means to add. All right, just means to add. Negative just means to remove. All right, keep it simple like that. That's why I just put add and remove. Now, reinforcement and punishment, same thing. You got to think of these things in a very simple way, very simple definitions. Similar how we talk about dominance, right? Dominance, first right to limited resource. Leave it at that. Reinforcement, it's to encourage. Leave it at that. You will make everything easier for yourself to understand and even to teach people if you just leave it at that. Punishment is just to discourage. Leave it at that, all right? This is going to make things very, very easy when we're going into the training. Now watch what happens when we put this together. All right, so we're talking about operant conditioning. Now remember, just to go a little backwards, it's not even remember, I didn't tell you. Operant conditioning, all right? This is Skinner, right? Skinner came up with this. It's a law of nature, it existed. He just put, put a name to it. Think of operant conditioning as, um, you know, the term operant, it comes from operator, meaning control something has control over what they're doing. So we're talking about an organism or something that has control over what they're doing, and then there's consequences that are gonna encourage or discourage that behavior. So that's the way we're gonna kind of remember what operant conditioning is compared to classical conditioning, which is actually easier, all right? Which is much simple, there's no control, it just, it just happens, right? Operant is an operator, all right? So I was just to go a little backwards, all right? Now, let's put these together. Because people always say the four quadrants of operant conditioning. What are they? Positive reinforcement. We all heard that. What is the definition of positive reinforcement? For remaining technical, just keep it at adding something to encourage. I, now, think how easy this is. I add a treat to encourage something. It could be a million things. You can add whatever you want. I can add whatever I want to add in and whatever I want to encourage. I add a treat to encourage a dog to sit. I add love to encourage a dog to come. I add a tug to encourage the dog to come. So this is, we know we're talking about positive reinforcement when we're adding something to encourage a uh, behavior. Right? So every time think, am I adding something and am I adding something to encourage, you are doing positive reinforcement. Now, positive, we can say positive punishment. Positive punishment. I'm adding something to discourage. So anytime I add something, to discourage something, that's positive punishment. So what kind of things would we add to discourage? This is usually all of like, what, what people refer to as like corrections in dog training. Whenever they're like jerking a leash or, or, or pumping a leash or pressing a button on an e-collar, whenever they're adding some bonker or they're hitting the dog with, they're adding a bonker to the head. Anytime someone is adding something to discourage something, I'm adding 
I'm adding an e-collar correction to discourage the dog from not coming. That's positive punishment. I'm adding a leash correction to discourage the dog from not sitting. It's usually we're discouraging the dog from not doing what we want or we're discouraging the dog from doing something that it that it's doing that we do not want the dog to do, right? We're discouraging the dog from doing things we don't want it to do, which is we're mostly talking about disobedience and just unwanted behavior, all right? I added, and, and I'm giving examples. I'm not saying this is what I do, but people say they add a knee to discourage jumping, right? They add um, um, an invisible fence system adds a shock to discourage to discourage the dog from going through the fence line. So every time, make it easy. It's like, what is this positive punishment? Oh, something was added and it discouraged the behavior. Yes, then that's positive punishment. All right. So positive can go like this, right? It can go like that or like that. All right. Positive reinforcement or positive punishment all right now we can also okay. different different color here the same thing goes for negative negative is just simply i put a minus sign there just remove if i'm going to remove something to re to encourage a behavior that's negative reinforcement let's get rid of these all right negative reinforcement so if i remove to encourage negative reinforcement so what kind of things would i remove to encourage a behavior all right we are usually removing something the dog does not like to encourage behavior so let's say we added we added um leash pressure on a dog's neck for not sitting all right we, that was positive punishment, right? We added to discourage. As soon as the dog starts to sit and we remove it, we did that to encourage. So that's negative reinforcement. You see a lot of um, you see a lot of trainers, right? Um, negative reinforcement, where they say they're. You know, a lot of like e-collar trainers where you see them starting off with like continuous button on an e-collar and then like moving the dog towards them and then releasing the button. That's negative reinforcement that they're mostly working with, right? They're removing a stimulation to encourage the dog to come, all right? That's negative reinforcement. That would be an example of negative reinforcement. Now, I promise if you stick with this, I'm going to make it this. If you haven't really gone over upper conditioning right now, your head's going to spin. But I'm going to show you an easy way to kind of study it besides just breaking down these words. All right. Um, now, also, what we have here is we have negative punishment. All right. Negative punishment. That's removing something to discourage a behavior. Now, this is where people get messed up with words. Think it is negative. If someone thinks negative is like something bad and punishment is even worse, you, a lot of people think, oh, negative punishment. That must be like a really harsh correction. No. Negative punishment, it is meant to discourage, but we're removing something to discourage. Carlos, I'm going to show one of your videos tonight, Carlos. Hope you don't mind because I love it. Um, um, we're going to, if we remove to discourage, that's negative punishment, right? So an example of that would be we're giving a dog love and they start jumping all over us and we want to discourage that behavior and we remove our love, all right? That is negative punishment. We remove the love to discourage jumping on us, right? Or we have the dog in a downstay and we're doing very early training and we're just giving the dog rewards. All right, rewards for staying in the down. And we're going, good boy, we're giving the treat, we're giving the treat, we're giving the treat. And then the dog gets up and we stop giving the treat. 
That's because we want to discourage the dog from getting up, this puppy from getting up. That's negative punishment. Okay? So negative, there's two different ways. Now I'm going to show you something else. These are things to remember to make it easy. Um, you got a paper towel. Let's see. What Dave has to say. Would removing all outlets ex access the play with other dogs? to create drive imbalances so a dog will be looking at you for its needs because they're negative punishment since no no not necessarily it sounds like you'd be talking about um, you know what you're talking about would be would be um, establishing operations if you're causing a de 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 deficit oh my stuttering today all right, so that sounds like establishing operations, um, but it could be if you're removing something to discourage a behavior, you have to think that I remove it to discourage a behavior, especially if it's the result of something. The dog did something and then you removed something and the dog understood, oh, my behavior caused dad to remove something that I like. All right. Um, um, so, yeah, that's establishing operations. Yeah, good. Good, Ken. All right. This will make sense, Dave. I think after this lecture, I think it's going to help you understand it more. Now, things to make it easier to remember, um, um, concepts of operant conditioning, is that these things never, I really cannot think of any example or too many examples where they happen by themselves. For example, if someone is given treats, is using like um, food reward or something the dog likes to encourage behavior, they are usually given, given treats for good behavior and taken away the treats when the dog isn't doing what they, what they want. It's usually the same thing that's being given and taken away. When we're talking about positive reinforcement and negative punishment, like this, these two go together. So, if you're adding, if you're giving treats during training, positive reinforcement, then you take it away, negative punishment, all right? We're adding to encourage the behavior, then we're removing it to discourage the behavior. They go hand in hand. So, it's usually adding and removing the same thing. So that's something that you can remember. It'd be like, oh, if I'm adding the treats, probably the removal of them, you know, is the negative punishment part. Same thing. You're given love, then the dog all of a sudden is not doing what you want, and you remove the love. That's the negative punishment. These are these are like sisters, all right? Positive reinforcement and negative punishment. They're going to be paired together. Now, if we cross them, if we use a chart that looks like this. Um, it works the same way like this, if we cross them, all right? When we're using positive punishment, it's, it is also whatever we are using to punish the dog uh, for positive punishment, the negative reinforcement is usually the removal of the same thing. So positive punishment and negative reinforcement go hand in hand. So I'll give you an example. Someone is training a dog to walk on a leash and the dog pulls and let's say they have like one of those halty collars, you know, like those ones that look like a horse harness. The dog pulls, they add pressure on the halty collar, right? They add to discourage, that's the positive punishment. Then the dog st stops pulling, they remove the pressure to encourage the behavior of not pulling. So they add the pressure to discourage the pulling, the dog no longer pulls, they remove the pressure. So it's positive, positive punishment gets added, then negative reinforcement is the removal. They go hand in hand, all right? We're gonna watch this in action. That's why I'm gonna use, um, I'll use Carlos's video since he's, since he's on. We'll put him on a spot. Show him such a good trainer he is. All right, um, let me see if I can flip my board. 
See if I can flip my board without knocking it over. Dun, 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 dun. Got this. All right. All right. So I did this to kind of like show you how we can make things a lot easier for ourselves. Um, this is how normally we think of. Um, operant conditioning. You hear about the four quadrants of operant conditioning. When I hear four quadrants of operant conditioning, and every way like I usually saw it like drawn like in a chart was kind of like this, you know, like in actual quadrants, sort of separating them all. And it might be like a definition or whatever. Now, I'm going to show you one of my, the way that I like to teach it. And I'm very proud of this because once I started thinking of it in this way, it it helped like clarify it in my own mind and had it make more sense. I do not like to think of these as quadrants, all right? I, what I like to do is do this, all right? Let's remove these lines. Dun, 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 dun. And this helps show the relationship. I like to show it as like a cycle or a wheel like this. Now, all of the best teaching you will ever do to a dog, or the, when you see a trainer connecting with the dog and the dog is picking up on things quick, it is because a trainer is using all four quadrants of operant conditioning, but they're using it in a cycle, like a wheel. Now, I'm going to give you an example, then we'll just watch a video of it. Let's suppose that you, you could see it most when someone is teaching a dog to heal. If they understand operant conditioning and they're using all of it. Um, and so, but if they're not using all four parts of operant conditioning, it's kind of like a wheel that is missing spokes or you take a chunk out of the wheel. It is not going to run smooth. And then it's going to stick at you. It's going to like, you're going to see it and it's going to just stand out in front of your face. And you're like, oh, they are not using all the communication they can. All right. When you see someone who is just punishing a dog and they're forgetting to encourage the dog um, or they're just missing any step, you're going to see a dog that is not learning as easily as it can and is usually insecure. And even if someone is not using punishment at all and only using reinforcement, good things, the dog may enjoy the training, but they're still not going to be learning as quickly um, as they could if someone was using punishment. Now, punishment, remember, it does not have to be harsh. It is just encouraging and discouraging the behavior. And even though it generally has to be something the dog dislikes, it does not have to be harsh. Now, let me give you the example of a dog who's being taught to train, you know, a, a good trainer who is training a dog to not pull on a leash or teaching a heel command. So um, I'll put on a video of Carlos. I got one of Davis and I got one of Carlos that I just pulled up that I pulled from like their own, you know, um, stuff that they were showing me. So let's say a trainer tells the dog to heal. And the dog right away starts healing the right way. They are going to add something positive to reinforce that behavior, to encourage the behavior. In the video, I'm going to show, depending if it's Davis or Carlos, they're at like different stages. Um, the Davis video, I believe he's still using rewards, more primary reinforcers, which we'll learn about. So, um, and Carlos, he's going to be going, good boy, good boy, which the dog associates with good things. So he's adding, we'll watch Carlos, this is first. He's adding praise to encourage the good heal. Now, as soon as the dog is not healing anymore, Carlos removes negative, the praise, to discourage the dog from not being in the right position. All right, so he's praising, he added the praise, 
the dog is doing well, he removed the praise. When the dog isn't doing well, then right after, and this happens like almost instantly, right after he removes the praise, he adds, that's positive, leash correction, which is like nothing in the video. Matter of fact, I think in the video, the leash never even gets tight on the dog. It's just even the movement, the dog thinking that he's going to get punished was enough to stop the dog. All right. So he adds leash pressure, you know, a leash correction or a leash pump to discourage not being in the right position. As soon as the dog is, you know, stops going to move ahead of Carlos, he removes, he removes his arm and, you know, and the punishment or what the dog associates with punishment to encourage, reinforcement is to encourage the behavior of not pulling, then he immediately starts adding praise again. And he's adding praise. So he's praising, the dog gets out of position, he removes the praise and goes right to adding the, the punishment. The dog is in the position, he removes, he removes the punishment. And then he goes to the praise. And then he goes like this. It's a cycle. It always goes in this direction. It is natural. If you look at this, it is like, it is a natural thing. And you do not, when it's done the right way, um, it works really, really well. It's a cycle, all right? It is a cycle. And you remove emotions from it, all right? Abuse, because we're going to be like, oh, which one's abusive? None of these are abusive. They can all be abusive, all right? I'm going to give you an example. Like, if you watch Carlos... There's nothing going on in his punishment that anyone would say is abuse. But if he started, oh, abuse is overly using something, excess, right? Excess or misusing. He's not mus misusing anything or he's not using an, ex an, an excess. So you're not going to see anything that would be considered abuse. Now, positive reinforcement and negative punishment, people associate this, right, with like, training that is like friendly like dog friendly dog training we're just adding treats and removing it but can this be abused of course this can be abused what if someone is and i've seen this what if a trainer is completely starving a dog in excess not giving a dog enough food so that the reinforcement will be even be more powerful even more powerful than the dog needs and the dog is constantly in a state of hunger and hunger pains, all right? You see this like it, you know, this was the argument even like at SeaWorld, right? Um, where they're in that tank and they're controlling them with food and these, the, you know, the, the, the orcas are basically begging for scraps of, of food or constantly hungry, all right? So it's a matter of, this is science, right? This is science and it's proven like it works. But any quadrant can be abused, all right? Any of them can be abused. Some are more easier to abuse than others and are more abused, but any of them can be abused, but all of them can be used correctly. So we have this cycle, all right? So we have this cycle. Now let's see, um, let's put on a couple of videos, all right? Let's see. Maureen says, I see that a lot. Dogs get really skinny. Yep. Not right. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of pause. I've seen this abused a lot. I've seen that abused. Like it, it goes under the radar. Like people don't think of it. When you see really skinny dogs in training, it's because someone is abusing negative, you know, positive reinforcement and negative punishment or just neglect. Some people keep dogs and like they're kenneling them. And they honestly don't understand those dogs need like more calories when they're being trained all day in the cold and the dogs just get skinnier and, and the trainer doesn't even realize it. But usually they're kind of starving them for a reason and they're overly doing it. It's not necessary, right? It's not necessary. All right, let me go put on Carlos. Let's see. Testing one, two, three. Let's see, I got Carlos here. 
All right, so I'm going to press play. Now, just watch him for a few minutes. I'm not going to talk. Just watch him and see if you can notice that he's adding praise when the dog is doing well. And now he's on like, you know, we'll get into this more, but he's going to praise at intervals. His praise is the reward for the dog. Because the dog already associates it with good things, good things to come. The dog knows. So he's going to be doing intervals. You're going to hear good boys, especially as soon as the dog is doing something right. And then he still gives it intermittently while the whole time while the dog is doing the right thing. But then it all stops the instant he punishes the dog. And see, his punishment is simply him sliding his hand down on the leash which the dog associates where if the dog, I mean, the dog is beating him to the punch, the dog is stopping himself. But that's really all the punishment is. He just wants the dog to stop because the dog, most of his punishments on here are for forging, meaning the dog going ahead of his heel because he's teaching a traditional heel, the dog going ahead of his heel. And I think when I watched this, there was one, the dog got distracted to the side and I believe Carlos gave a punishment for the dog, like looking out to the left or something. And he said, heel. The little leash punishment. As soon as the dog comes back into heel, he removes, you know, he removes the the leash pumps to encourage, and he goes right back to praising the dog, and then he removes the praise. But just watch him and just realize there's a lot going on here. All right, there's a lot going on here. And right, so I'll hit play. Oh, beautiful. It's freaking beautiful. All right. Stuff like, I just love stuff like that. To me, that's, some of you guys like watch football and watch like instant replays. I mean, but like do catch. This is what I watch. You know, I watch stuff like, like uh, this. All right. Um, he is, he is praising. He's praising. And then as soon as the dog's out of position, the praise stops. You see his hands slide down. That's the punishment. That's the punishment. All right, the dog stopped. He removes the punishment. And as I say, this is like the lightest form of just his hand. The dog is associating it with punishment. It's, it's, we'll get into it, but it's a, it's a conditioned punisher. His hand just sliding down. The dog associates it with pumps on the collar. So that's enough for the dog, all right? Then he praises, everything gets removed, and he goes again. Now this dog, if you watch him, he's, he's learning quick and he's wagging his tail because he's confident. The communication is just so good that this dog is going to learn this heel position. And, you know, Carlos has given him repetition, repetition to drill in that this is what you do, this is what you do. Also notice, we covered it last time, establishing operations. Because he's just doing this in like a living room, this is all you need during the learning process, everything, his motivators, it's easier to use his motivators. His praise is more motivational. He looks like he's given mostly love as his reward. I didn't notice we were giving treats there. He's using his love is the reward. Dogs love affection, especially if you control it. Establish an operations. Therefore, the dog is eating it up when Carlos is petting him. But that good boy, good boy, the dog is associate, already as associated that, oh, I'm going to get love for this, right? Let's watch Carlos a little more just because it's just so damn beautiful.
Whoops. Okay. All right, good stuff. So I love stuff like that, all right? So he's, and the earlier on in the training that you'd be doing with the dog, you even do more prey. I'm, I tell people it's like a light switch. The dog should always be as clear as possible, especially during the process, if they're doing right or they're doing wrong. So especially early in the training like that, you see Carlos is good boy, good boy, good boy. He's doing a lot. I will, like, I don't know what session that was with that dog, but first sessions like that, if it was like a first session, I am like, there's not even like a second, Paul, like, I'm good boy, you're so good, you're good boy, good boy, good boy, and then I'll well, stop, heal. Dog's in position, good boy, good boy. And then you start, you can start spacing it out by reading the dog's body language, because you can't be walking down the street, right, singing, singing to the dog the whole time. And that's what you see, that's what Carlos was doing there. He was starting to thin out the praise, but he's watching the dog's body language. He's looking at the confidence of, of the dog. Now let's watch this, let's watch another one, because it's the same thing, just so you can see more than one trainer at work. This is, um, Davis, hold on, Daryl's typing. Um, this is going to be some of Davis. Davis's camera is not as close, and you have to listen a little harder for him. The difference with Davis, and like I said, there is so many things, there's so many variables as far as what you can do, is um, the collar can be a variable. It's anything that can, that can discourage a dog. It could be a no pull harness. It could be a prong collar. It could be a halty collar. It could be a buckle collar, you know, if the dog is sensitive or not. The rewards could be treats. It could be love. It could be a toy, you know, but we're plugging it in to a cycle of communication that makes sense to the dog. Um, so let me see. I just want to see... Let's see what Daryl said. He said, his dog looks to acknowledge leash pressure. What if the dog doesn't understand leash pressure? How would you correct that? Okay, good question, Daryl. Um, but we will, that's called escape conditioning, all right? So we will go over that. That is, we teach the dog how to escape at first. So even though I'm showing obedience, the obedience itself is is advanced you know we're gonna go into that in this course when we get into the training but what i want you to pick up from this is just when is positive reinforcement happening when does um negative punishment happen when does positive punishment happening when does negative reinforcement happen and when does it go back to positive reinforcement i want you to notice this cycle be and the difference between these because we have to use it in a simple way first, in habitation. Then once we go over habitation, yes, we're going to go over exactly that. But the quick answer, just uh, because it's such a quick answer, is that they don't understand leash pressure. You teach the dog leash pressure first before you, before you do that. And, it's, and you do it the same way, right? We do it the same way. You could start anywhere, all right? Um, but escape conditioning is... We do the punishment that we want the dog to understand. So suppose you're doing leash pressure. I tend to do leash pumps, um, but people can plug almost anything into this system. I like to use pumps. The average dog does not really completely understand it. And then we encourage the dog with a treat or with your praise. And as soon as the dog releases that pressure, you know, you're praising the dog. But escape conditioning is the process of teaching that dog first how to escape a punishment. So you're actually teaching them and you're making it easy. Um, then we teach them how to avoid it. Um, but we will go over that. I promise you we'll, you know, we will go over that. But it's, it's escape conditioning. And if you want, you can go, if you go into, um, let's see, we go over here. If you actually go to our, um, our obedience chart, which is, if you go onto our homepage, 
really anywhere. And you can the best one of the best ways you can you can go is you could click on it. You can see an example with the sit what it's about, but you could click on here, escape conditioning, and look at a lesson as it comp how it falls into place with the sit. And then you just modify the exercise. You could do the same thing with pressure. I don't do leash pressure in the training because um, because I use leash pressure for resistance training. Um, um, but we will explain that. We will explain that, I probably should. Um, but that could probably answer some of your questions as of right now if you want to kind of jump ahead a little. Um, here's Davis Tran with Nova, all right? So again, what I want you to focus on is this cycle. Understanding this cycle will help you understand operating conditioning. And heel is it's good because there's so much communication going on. Look to see when he's adding something. He's mostly using praise and rewards. He's still pairing his, his praise with treats. He removes it when the dog is not in the position. All right. He adds punishment, which again, it's just a little bit with the leash. He removes it when the dog stops moving. In this style of, of healing, you'll see when the dog goes ahead, all we want the dog to do is just stand still until we walk back ahead of the dog. The dog doesn't necessarily have to walk backwards or anything in this style of healing. And then as soon as the dog's back in the position, he adds reinforcement and it's a cycle. So we'll watch him and just watch the cycle at work. I'll try to raise the volume so you can hear him a bit, but you're going to see consistencies. And the most common consistency is not only in the trainer, is in the dogs. You're actually going to see dogs that are engaged and are confident because they are, um, they, they're, there's communication going on there that they could pick up on. And it's fair. It's well-timed and it is, and it's fair. Let me put on this because I have the volume off on my laptops. Oh, click over here. Let me get some volume. Good. Good. So yeah, Nova looks like she was at a little earlier stage and you see he's also doing some encouraging and prompting still. But the one thing, the consistency you notice is his use of the praise where he's removing it and taking it away when the dog is doing well. And even when he uses the prompt, he's still using a prompt there to encourage her. As soon as she does it, he starts praising. So he's very good at using his praise here. He's using a lot. So she knows I'm doing right, I'm doing right, I'm doing right. And the removal of the praise is it actually becomes a punishment because it's discouraging her from doing what she is doing. You know, And he, like I say, he just wants her to stop. And then he's doing a little footstep thing to teach her to stand still until he gets ahead of her again. And then he's prompting her. But his punishment is mostly here you know, you'll see, he's using a lot of love. It's the removal of the praise and adding of like very, I mean, I haven't even really watched how much of a punishment he's doing. It's next to nothing, all right? The more, the better you are at, at using positive reinforcement and showing the dog what to do, you will be surprised that the punishment 
becomes less and less. The punishment is used to help the dog, actually. It actually helps the dog when you're, when you're using this the right way, all right? It does not mean that there's not time to make it, you know, to, to elevate it in intensity and stuff like that. But when you start introducing punishment in training, it's mostly helping the dog. Because the dog, you showed the dog what to do. And the dog is mostly trying to do the right thing because they want to do the right thing. And then this helps them when it's introduced the right way. Um, let's just watch a little bit more of, of Davis. And then I'll take some some questions all right yeah. giving us some love it's got the treats Thank you. So he's adding praise and treats to be in the right position. Punishment. She stopped, so you remove the punishment pattern. Tail starts going when he praises. nice all right so I love videos like that because it shows a trainer I love these ones where they just you know where trainers not talking and you just watch them in their element and Nova if you don't know Nova she's yeah she's a dog she doesn't have a lot of confidence you know and um, she's looking to do the right thing and I don't think Dave has ever had to do hardly any type of leash correction with her at all. I mean, everything I've seen him do is so super light with this dog. She really tried so hard um, to do it. So you see, he's talking to her and you see even her tail stop wagging and her ears go back. And then when he starts talking to her, it helps her out a lot. So he goes, so this is the sort of thing that this is, we'll get into it. This is like a phase two training. And it's where I always spend my most time training the dogs. It's where the magic happens. It's where the dogs are learning rules. And you establish operations. Like he's in a pretty quiet spot where if he did her like um, somewhere too quiet, she might not mess up at all. But here, it seems like just enough. She's mess. I mean, she's trying so hard. The dog, I mean, we're talking about it. He's just like fine-tuning her. But what he's looking for is um, he's looking for... Um, he's looking for confidence out of that dog. And this dog, I believe, did do some training with another trainer that did use much harsher punishment on her. So some dogs, that's where the rehabilitation comes into place. So people say, what is rehabilitation? It's when you're bringing the dog back to a normal place, you know. And this type of training does help rehabilitate dogs and make them confident. It lets them know, I can do the right thing and my handler is going to be fair. I am going to get communication. I am going to get the minimum amount of punishment, you know, in order for it to work. But a lot of training sessions, when you build your foundation, that's what it looks like. Now, again, this is not about the technique at this point, but um, it's about understanding this, all right? Positive reinforcement, negative, what exactly it is. And most people, if you, it's the first time you really tried to understand it, you have to go over it. You're going to have to take the stream, go back to the beginning, replay it. You can even look at the one with me and Earl. I'll stick it. I'll put a link to it underneath here because it's a little bit quicker. It gets right to the point and it's, you know, has a little humor to it. I dress up in the, you know, in the dog outfit. I love it. It's funny. All right. Um, and watch it and then think about it. You have to like, actually, if it's your first time, like trying to fair operant conditioning, 
you need to, during the day, think about it. When you're driving around, think of everything you do with a dog, and is that positive reinforcement, or is that negative reinforcement? Which one is it? Am I adding to encourage? Am I removing to discourage? Um, am I, when you're adding and removing, the same thing, you know, the treat with Davis here, or the love, you know, or praise, anything that is being added to encourage positive reinforcement when it's removed negative punishment, all right? The leash um, in these videos, I mean, he's using so many conditioned punishers, which we'll go about. His just, the lead in, in Carlos's video, his, his leg, him stopping and his hand sliding down, the dog, the dog associates that with it touching the collar and putting a little bit of pumps on the on the collar, almost nothing. So that's why you're not even seeing anything. Both of these trainers were so consistent and fair, they don't even need to actually do the punishment. They're just doing the movements that the dog associates with punishment. But either way, the bringing on of those movements is the punishment. They're doing that, you know, they're adding that to discourage. They remove those movements to encourage the right behavior and then they go to it, all right? Any video you watch on the site, the Teresa videos too, in the phase two, watch the Teresa videos, the phase two videos, you'll see it, you'll see it all the time. She's, she's gonna be very, very precise with it too. Watch the healing videos too, her healing videos are good with the halty. You're gonna see a cycle there, you're gonna see a cycle. So that's what I want everyone to study, all right? And then I promise we'll do um, habitation chart because then I feel like I could just talk about punishment um, and reward better. The terms are misused all the time, even by some pretty good trainers. But there are a lot of good trainers that are good trainers, even humane trainers, but they don't know how to describe themselves. But you want to understand this for a lot of obvious professional professional reasons. But it really helps to troubleshoot things too. Um, all right. Does anyone have any questions about this stream? All right. Looks like we, you know, we, I kept this one to about one hour, so it's not too hard to swallow.